he hello everybody. Uh, it's really impressive room with many people, so <laughs> I'm very glad to be here with you today. So I will speak today about protein aggregation or oxidation during processing. And processing means, in, in this case, more specifically drug product processing, because I'm in, in, the, in, the, DP, in the DP path. However, uh, many concepts may stay the same as well for uh, upstream processing. So uh, the scope is first to say what is at stake with aggregates. Uh, to present my point of view, which is an engineer point of view. I'm not a scientist, uh, I'm not a fundamental scientist, I'm an engineer, so uh, my role is to set up robust processes uh, for industrial, and uh, then, of course, I'm looking the scientific data on a specific point of view, and then I will detail some mechanism. So, what is at stake? Uh, this is uh, coming from a publication from uh, one of my colleagues when he was a postdoc in Amsterdam. And uh, uh, when you stress proteins and maps, usually you can get aggregates. And these aggregates, the problem with these aggregates is that they may be immunogenic. So here you see that we have, uh, um, ah, yes. <laughs> Uh, they have uh, injected these, these uh, proteins which have been stressed and uh, where aggregates have been uh, formed into these poor mice and uh, they have got uh, quite a lot of immunogenic answer. So what does it mean? It means that they are able to detect anti-drug antibodies. So what is the problem with that? First problem with that is that, of course, this will reduce probably the efficacy of a medicine because these anti-drug antibodies are against the drug. But moreover, you may have much more severe effects. Indeed, if you consider this paper from the FDA about um, this EPO-like um, compound, this, uh, this product was withdrawn of the market after 49 uh, anaphylaxis were reported, and within these 49 cases, seven people died. So you see, it's a severe issue. So why did it happen with this product? In fact, during the clinical trials, uh, they use a single dose formulation. They move then to a multiple dose formulation just by adding probably some preservative, and they, they observe a little bit uh, a small increase of uh, subvisible particles, but nobody was uh, worrying about because it was still in the USP specification. But see the results. So the message is that you should be very careful with aggregates and even nanoparticulates which may come from your process, and that uh, the devil is in the detail. So we have to be very careful. So I'm not an immunologist. I'm not. A protein scientist, I am an engineer. So what is our duties as engineer? So we need to understand, and it's very good for me to be here with so much very good uh, academic or industrial scientists, understand what is happening from a fundamental point of view, not because it's our goal to make fundamental science, but it's our goal to translate this fundamental science into practical things. Uh, then we have to define study protocols, how to, how to make the studies in, uh, in experiments which mimic downscale uh, the process, uh, but with very uh, small amount of product. And finally, last but not least, you know when we, are, when we have a project, we want to move from a clinical plant to industrial plant, we do not have always a choice of, a, of where we will go. We will go where the man and run say, okay, we have an opportunity uh, to optimize uh, the cost of this workshop if you put this product in this workshop. But maybe this workshop doesn't fit with the product property. So we have to be very careful to understand exactly what is a, the practical characteristic of this process and to see how it fits or not with uh, the product. So typical fill and finish process. Very often start, very often we, we, we receive a frozen drug substance 
and we have to thaw it, then we have to compound it, uh, to filter it, sometime to lyophilizate, not always, uh, and this is taking place into uh, this beautiful stainless steel equipment, but this stainless steel equipment itself may be uh, uh, a problem. So just try to give a, a quick map of the risk. Um, first, during freezing, we may have cryoconcentration, pH swing, excipient crystallization, and so on and so forth. Then we have um, a compounding vessel, so we may have ab uh, abrasion risk. We may have uh, turbulent uh, shear. Uh, we may have uh, air, air bubble generation. Uh, in the filter, we may have surfactant adsorption. When you lose a surfactant, when we lose the protection of the antibody, we may have, in some cases, a significant uh, drug absorption, especially if the drug is very dilute. Um, uh, and uh, we have also shear rate uh, in, in pipes or needles. We have, again, shear rate in, in filling system. And finally, uh, query concentration again and uh, uh, some funny phenomenon during, in the lyophilization. And we should not forget that we have to decontaminate our wraps or isolators, and then we introduce uh, usually hydrogen peroxide or other substances like that, which are not always uh, with no effect on our drugs. So I will first speak about the mechanical stress, and there are a couple of presentations today in the formulation stream uh, which have already prepared the, the landscape, uh, but only a few of, of, of you were, were here. So mechanical stress is an established effect, but the root cause is highly debated. Uh, it will summarize in a, in a question, shear or not shear, that is a question. So maybe the question asked by Hamlet, I'm not sure. <laughs> so uh, to make it very simple, to get aggregates from a protein, the first step is to get unfolding or partial unfolding of a protein, such a way that you can expose the hydrophobic big parts to each other and they, and, they, and, and they stick together. And to make it, again, very simplistic, there are um, two major ways to do it. Either you stretch the protein under shear, or you put the protein on a hydrophobic surface where it unfolds spontaneously, and then you may have aggregation. And we, have a, we may have a coupling between mechanical effects through mass transfer and adsorption. And this is really intensively debated question in the literature. So to my knowledge, the first guy who, spoke, who had the idea that something may happen to a polymer in a shear field was Pierre-Gilles Degen, Nobel Prize of Physics in 91. So it was purely thinking. Uh, and this time he said, OK, a polymer chain in a shear, in a, in a, should extend. But us, there is also tumbling movement should collapse. And they should have this collapse and stretch in a simple shear field in laminar flow. And uh, by the way, this prediction was really observed. For instance, here yeah, beautiful studies with a DNA molecule. So it's very large DNA compared to a map. But you can see this. The same molecule, uh, uh, which is collapse, elongated, collapse, elongated. So it's what may happen in a shear field. However, already in 1974, uh, Pierre Gilles de Gênes said that should happen only for 100,000 second minus one, which is a huge shear, shear rate that usually we don't have in a process unless maybe we use something very special like a high pressure homogenizer. Uh, so this is for basic uh, f fundamental aspects. About the same period of time, in the 70s, 80s, guys started to make experiments with enzyme. So why enzyme? I believe well, part of the answer is that at this time, uh, probably biophysical methods were not so much developed as they are now. And uh, the testing the activity of the enzyme is a very simple test to do. And uh, then you can easily characterize if there's any degradation. So uh, in, the, in these papers, the guys were 
circulating uh, solution of um, enzyme, uh, lysozyme or other enzyme uh, through a capillary, a long capillary, were very thin, and, and they did it several times. Such a way they accumulate a lot of shear strain. So they got quite interesting results, and I would say two interesting results. First one is that it's not the shear rate per se which looks to be important, but the shear strain. So what is a shear strain? It's a shear rate multiplied by time. So solicitation multiplied by time. It means that if you have a shear rate of 1 and a time of 10, or if you have a, a shear rate of 10 and a time of 1, you experimentally, you get the same effect. And oops, it was wrong. <laughs> OK. And you see here, this is a shear strain, and this is the effect, and these are the shear rates. Uh, the other very interesting thing for the engineer is that the shear strain is simply, uh, again, <laughs> Uh, is simply the length of the diameter ratio, which is very easy to calculate. The second aspect they, 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 they said is that, uh, in fact, uh, until you are uh, below a certain threshold, which is around 100,000 to 1 million, nothing happens. And then you have a gradual decrease of activity. More recently, uh, I would say a similar spirit Experiments were performed, but not anymore in a capillary, in a quet viscosimeter, uh, so rotor and, uh, and stator, and uh, with a gap, you have a similar, uh, nearly similar uh, laminar flow in it. And here it was directly in situ me me measurements of the uh, alpha helix unfolding by uh, circular decorism and, and fluorescence. And the results are finally very similar. You get so you see there are much more points, different shear rates, and you see again this effect of a threshold, and you see again that only uh, the shear strain, so uh, shear rate multiplied by time is important. So things seem to look quite simple, but uh, it has been highly debated, and uh, many, many papers have said, that there may be bias, and uh, the current opinion is that probably, more probably, the shear is pushing the proteins on the surface where they can unfold, and then uh, they can easily uh, aggregate because they are unfolded. So, this is, so I would say that the dominant opinion is that it's probably not shear alone, but shear uh, coupled with uh, adsorption uh, on hydrophobic surface. And this is uh, an important uh, paper uh, I invite you to read. Uh, so recently, to go back to experiments uh, in, in our labs, we say, OK, we have maps. We want to understand if our maps are at risk. And this is a very recent uh, experiment of, uh, on, on the map M. M, why M? Because it's mystery. I will not tell you which map it is. <laughs> and it's, on a, it's a, on a capillary. So this is a capillary, you see? This is a capillary. Uh, and uh, this is very similar to the Charm uh, and Wong uh, experiment, but we avoided to, to use a pump because the pump itself, we don't know what it can do. We only use a pressurized vessel, we filter, and uh, we collect either the product after filtration or after the capillary, and, and we run two times in the capillary. So the capillary itself is peak, poly ketone, so quite hydrophobic material. So what is the result? The result was surprising. A T0, if we look at the SVPs or the nanoparticles by DLS, nothing or nothing significant. But by chance, we realized, it was not by purpose, just by chance, we realized the product 1.5 months after storage at 5 degrees, which is the normal t uh, temperature of storage of, uh, of this MAB, and, uh, and, and most MAB, by the way. And you see that we have a huge increase, and this is log scale. So it's hundreds to thousands difference. So it's very significant effect. So it means that in this, in this experiment, going through the capillary has probably generated seed, 
at T0 you cannot see anything, but after one month, there is a huge difference. If it is shear or uh, if it is a hydrophobic effect, to be honest, I have no idea. But for sure, there is uh, an effect. Now I go to even more practical things. And probably uh, one of the authors of, 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 of these experiments are in the room because he presented that in the formulation stream. So uh, again, I acknowledge uh, it's a very good work and it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm thanking again this team from Genentech because we used their methodology and it was extremely profitable for us. Uh, don't say that to uh, Genentech CEO. <laughs> so here we compare two technologies of, of, of mixing. This one is a kind of technology we could, you, you may find uh, in the old old fashioned companies like Sanofi and as well Roche, which is, uh, I would say, part of, Genentech is part of Roche. And uh, this, is, this technology with a disposable vessel is, um, is a kind of new technology. It was not designed to avoid aggregates. It was designed to be disposable, easy to clean, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it is uh, typically what we get in, in, in new plants. What has been observed by uh, our colleagues of Genentech is that they use a huge degradation and aggregation linked to that. It was, uh, in, in their case, they, uh, they, very uh, they had a very clever way to, to, to characterize it by filtration, but uh, so uh, it was a clear effect. Uh, we had also, from academic point of view, very similar, uh, very similar information with this uh, paper where we, we see uh, here the difference uh, it's a magnet agitator, and this is a magnet agitator, which is, you see these holes, has a little, just a little bit contact. And here, in this experiment, it was seen as well that there's a huge degradation when there is a contact. And the interpretation is that aggregates form on the surface, and that the abrasion, due to the contact, solid solid contact, just remove the aggregates. So we did the same kind of experiment, so one of MAP, that we are gonna, going to transfer to a site, and the site had this famous bottom imp, uh, impeller, and we say, mm, this map is fragile. We would like to, do, to make this experiment before. And we were lucky. We were lucky because here you can see, with no contact and with contact, we have exactly the same results as Gen and Tech guys. So here we have a, a risk, and, and therefore we have taken the decision not to keep the vessel which was existing, but to invest a new vessel uh, with a magnetic uh, uh, levitation mixer. So, stress during filling. Uh, we have three major filling technologies, time pressure, peristaltic pump, and rotative pump. Again, rotative pump was a favorite in, in the old time because it's the most accurate, less sensitive to, to changes, and so on, uh, but it's as well as the most dangerous for maps. <laughs> so why is it dangerous for maps? You see the movement is like this, it's a piston which is moving up and down and at the same time rotating. And you have a gap. So basically, again, a question of very small gap and abrasion. And uh, it has been shown, for instance, in a PhD thesis, uh, by in a uh, main in Basel, that if you compare your circulator map through uh, this pump and you compare as a reference to um, a peristaltic pump, once on Marlow peristaltic pump, in this case, you see a clear increase in, case, in this case of a Z average measured by DLS. In the literature, it has been argued, and this is a really interesting paper. It's, uh, you can read that like a novel. There's a lot of suspense in it. And uh, they have shown that, in fact, it's not at all, it's not at all an effect of shear. At least, uh, it's an effect of, uh, not a shear, it's an effect of shear, but not on the map itself. It's just because the movement is making shedding of nanoparticulates of stainless steel or of a ceramics. And these nanoparticulates act, act a seed to create aggregates. And the demonstration of that is that by uh, 
uh, running just WFI through the machine and then uh, spiking with this WFI the product you could get the, nano the, the aggregates. So again, for the, same, for the same map that we had to transfer to this workshop, we had the choice between two lines, the rotary piston pump and the time pressure line. The industrial colleagues preferred the rotary piston pump because of uh, our second venience issues, flexibility and so on. But they say, oh, we will do the test. We did the test. And by the way, we, we, we obtain a very clear difference in aggregates. So again, it's very important before to go to the industrial workshop to make the test and to see if it works. So, uh, oh, time is running. So I, I, I'm obliged to go a little bit faster. So freezing, freezing stress. What happens during freezing? What happens during freezing is just that you, you make ice, OK. It's not a big new. But when you are making ice, this ice is pure. And then in between, what you get is more and more concentrated. And then protein comes more and more closer to each other. Excipients may crystallize, buffer may crystallize, and then pH may suddenly change, what is called pH ring, and so on and so forth. And everything continues until we get uh, uh, the glass transition temperature, which is called in this case Tg prime. So, practical consequence is not um, so. It's a product O oh, because uh, when we saw the results, we say O. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, here you see we store the product at three conditions. One is plus five degrees, so as a solution. Minus 20 degree, which is a very standard conditions for a freezer, and minus 80 degree, which is not really a standard conditions. And what you can see is the kinetics of, uh, uh, of uh, appearance of uh, oligomers. And uh, it's quite old results, it's at least 10 years old. And you can see here that the minus 20 degree is increasing much more than the minus 80, that is not a surprise but it's increasing more than 5 degrees. So in this case, minus 20 was the worst case. And I'm not sure it's unique. It, why? It's because you are above the TG prime, so you still have mobility. We are even well above the TG prime. In this case, it was minus 45, so minus 20 is clearly above. And of course, uh, the molecules come as a protein molecules, come very close to each other. And then you can increase, despite of a lower temperature, you can increase the kinetics because of this close contact and this high probability of shocks in between the, the proteins. And uh, there is a very nice uh, paper of Mike Pickle about the, this effect. So oxidative stress. Oxidative stress, uh, there are many. We may have, uh, as well, contamination by uh, leaching of metals. I believe there was a talk about this. Uh, I, I could not assist, unfortunately, but uh, it's something which happened. But here I will just speak about one important thing. So again, you see the, these beautiful isolators and rubs. And we are obliged to decontaminate by hydrogen peroxides. Uh, and of course, we remove the hydrogen peroxide, but there's always a risk that traces are remaining inside the product. Mm -hmm. So uh, hydrogen peroxide is, is, is not at all a friend of a drug which are prone to oxidation. You know, all know that can trigger uh, radical oxidation things, so it can be awful. So in order to do that, again, in order to de-risk, what we are doing is a spiking uh, with different concentration from uh, zero ppm is, of course, a reference to 0.1 to 0.5 ppm uh, being uh, the, uh, I would say, reasonable range of contamination and uh, 1 to 5 ppm being uh, the worst case scenario. And then we put the product under stability. So you see that in this case, in this particular case, we don't have any problem until uh, 0.5 or 1 ppm. So normally the product should, should be safe, but it is not always the case. So if we have, anyway, it's a, pro, uh, uh, a point we have to take care about. 
So, it's my conclusion, by, by the way, I was, not too, I was not too late, I was too early. <laughs> so, I need to spend five minutes about the conclusion, it will be difficult. <laughs> but you know, I'm trying, you know? <laughs> so, as I say, aggregation is a serious concern and maybe a serious concern for our patients uh, because of immunogenic risk. Many in our process, many steps may damage the protein, and uh, this is, of course, depending on the protein itself, of the formulation, and of the technology and equipment. So we have really to use, and we call it, a de risking strategy, really to understand what is the specific fragility of our product and what is the specific stress of our equipment and to see if we can, with, without danger, put our new product in our existing vessels, or if we need to, to change something, to invest, or if we can move from one line, if the product is successful, for example, for example, we may have a situation where one line is not sufficient, we want to go to the next line, but then maybe we have some incompatibility. So it's a kind of, uh, of things I, I wanted to, to speak uh, to you today. And acknowledgement to many of my colleagues,